Welcome back Cubs, Dire Wolf here. And today we're going to be responding to a video from a YouTuber named Seedling who asked the question, is female privilege real? The assumption of this question is that male privilege does exist and that male privilege is much greater than female privilege if female privilege does exist. What you also need to understand about the speaker is that Seedling is a far left regressive feminist who believes that the patriarchy is real and that it is oppressing all women. And joining me on debunking this feminist lie is the YouTuber, A Helping Hand. Thanks for the invitation wolf always happy to collaborate and share ideas these regressives are often best not faced alone if for nothing else than to retain an anchor of sanity at the shores of reality and i've seen this particular regressive before so i know we're in for a fun-filled evening of mental gymnastics well i'm glad you're able to join us for this video let's see what seedling has to say about male and female privilege hey y'all hey you know i gotta hand it to some of these feminists while their arguments are garbage, at least they have the decency to advertise it beforehand by matching their stereotypes to the letter. What is violently purple hair these days, really, other than a scalp-mounted trigger warning? This is another video I'm doing in a series with Everyday Feminism, which is a website dedicated to helping you stand up to and break down everyday oppression. I think you mean to say a series that educates you on how to be a perpetual victim and how to identify and overreact to imaginary oppressions in your life. Because when there is no real oppression to complain about, manufactured problems are just as effective in providing momentum to the feminist complaint train. All aboard! And in this video, I want to discuss the question of female privilege. So, to be clear, I'm not in this video talking about cis privilege, that is, the privilege that cisgender people have in a society which oppresses trans and gender non-conforming people. And I have a hunch you're going to downplay the privileges and power that women have in our culture and upplay the power and privileges that men have in our culture. I'll bet you you want equality in every place where men have an advantage, but you don't want equality in every place that women have an advantage. Oh, that's exactly what she wants. You can tell that's what she wants just from her insistence on clarifying that she literally means female privilege and not cis privilege, as if the idea of women having privilege in any capacity is so ludicrous by default. I'm talking about something different, something I'm often asked about or frankly told about in my comments section, and that is the elusive female privilege. And by elusive you mean identifiable, measurable, tangible, and observable, right? Elusive, she says. You know, if that Wildberry Skittles landslide atop your skull and your completely unnecessary clarification weren't already indication enough, I think this word you're using tells us all we need to know about just how dismissive you plan on being. And in record time, too. Well before you made an actual point. Good job. Golf clap. Golf clap. So, firstly, why do people think that this is a thing? The main arguments I see about this come from men, um, men who take issue with certain social norms or stats or even legal structures which seem to give women advantages over men. Since you seem confused about whether or not women have advantages in some areas of our culture over men, I'm going to break it down for you, but I don't want to be accused of mansplaining, so I'm going to let a woman explain to you some of the pros and cons of being a man in our culture. Here are some other perks of being male in our culture. Aside from the higher risk of suicide and death on the job, your friend's little blue privileged bundles face at least a 10 times greater risk of homelessness, 20 times the risk of being incarcerated, with consistently longer sentences for the exact same crimes, a 3 to 4 times greater risk of being a victim of violent crime, an exactly equal risk of being a victim of domestic violence, along with a roughly 0% chance of being offered a bed in a shelter. An exactly equal risk of being forced into sexual intercourse, but the privilege of having it not be considered rape in 80% of cases simply because the perpetrator was female. Twice the risk of having a spouse initiate the divorce. Twenty times the risk of losing custody of the children upon said divorce. And a higher death rate with respect to 14 of the 15 leading causes of death, leading to a lower life expectancy and the understanding that despite all this, roughly... Eight to a hundred times as much public money will be spent on the health of the opposite sex. Men and women are very clearly not treated equally in our culture. And it is very disingenuous to claim that male privilege is a real thing, but that female privilege is not. Gotta love Karen Strawn. She's pretty consistently the golden standard for women who take issue with being infantilized by this feminist victim narrative, of which there are no small number. 
And while I could add to that list, I've no doubt Skittles here is going to give me plenty of opportunity to do just that very soon. You're making my job very easy, Wolf. So think, for example, of the very often cited stat about women being more likely to receive custody of children in a divorce case. On average, over 80% of women receive custody of their children in a divorce. And let's not forget the feminist tender years doctrine that Caroline Norton used to set this bias standard 144 years ago. Not to mention how easy it is for a woman to sway a judge's decision in these cases with crocodile tears and empty claims of abuse. These kinds of perceived inequalities. Again, you use the word perceived. You mean to say identifiable, measurable, tangible, and observable. You're attempting to magnify the struggles of women and to minimize the struggles of men. This is a dishonest manipulation of language that I will not ignore. It's also a blatant disregard of hard data that directly contradicts her implication of these privileges being imagined which is the predictable first step of the dismissive feminist. So next, she's undoubtedly going to use apologetics and weak justifications that paint women as victims even when they're benefiting, a la positive discrimination and benevolent chauvinism. Are often told to me as proof. Proof that women have privilege in their being women. Uh, that being born a woman means that we will have it easier than men in a lot of ways. It will be easier for you in some ways to be born a woman, as it will also be harder for you in some ways. Just like it is easier for some ways for men, and harder for some ways for men. You're comparing apples to oranges. Men and women are different, and they are not equal in all ways. And there's the opportunity I said would come along, so let's take advantage of it, shall we? It's easier to be a girl on the playground, as you will be excused from the otherwise rough-and-tumble machismo pissing contest due to the still prevalent don't hit girls even when they hit you double standard. It's easier to be a young woman in school due to the fact that public school formats were revamped decades ago to align more with the female way of learning, and you now have a markedly higher graduation rate to show for it. It's easier to be a woman in college, because there are still scholarships and Title IX policies exclusive to your sex even though you have been the majority of students and graduates for a good while now. Plus, nobody in those hallowed halls is inhibiting your development with the constant demands that you check your privilege or unlearn your toxic femininity. Just to mention a few. You know, because people hold doors for us and pay for our dinner. Privilege, right? Wrong. And here's why pri female privilege is not as straightforward as many men would like you to think. And I think if you opened your mind to the male perspective, you might realize that male privilege is not as straightforward and oppressive and evil as you say it is. And by the way, those examples you just used of holding doors and buying meals are examples of a word that I know you know all too well. Chivalry. A now nine centuries old standard of battle etiquette which originally had little to do with women except for those little caveats which were supposed to speak to the gallantry of a proper knight. And isn't it funny that those caveats favoring women were the only parts to stand the test of time up to the modern era, to the point where we have actually forgotten what the word chivalry means. Horsemanship. It's derived from the old French version of the word cavalier, chevalier. Even when killing each other over territorial disputes, we still somehow manage to make it all about women. And yet you have the audacity to claim that you have no inherent privilege when you are born with a vagina. The first thing is... What is perceived as female privilege usually refers to some benefit in the private or domestic sphere. So yes, maybe we do have to pay for dinner dates less often due to social norms. Norms we did not create, I might add. False. See, society is made up of both men and women, and society as a whole is what helps develop those gender norms. Women and women's opinions are not without social influence and power. It's women's attitudes towards picking men who show themselves to be great providers and who cater to their needs the most that create and reinforce behaviors such as paying for dinners and opening doors. Men did not get together in a meeting and say, we're going to treat women like less than men by opening doors for them. Men just realize it's the men who do those behaviors who get the girl. You can't blame men for behaviors that you reinforce. And while we're at it, I'm not going to let that private or domestic spheres comment slide, because it's a flat dismissal of all of the institutional privileges you have as well. There is nothing private or domestic about the fact that no military in history has ever required your sex to sacrifice themselves on the battlefield. There is nothing private or domestic about the standard of allowing women to abandon a burning building or sinking ship ahead of men. And there is nothing private or domestic about social venues hosting special nights where your sex drinks free as an industry standard because your mere presence brings in paying customers. Uh, yes, we often receive custody of children, also due to social norms surrounding motherhood and domestic labor, which we did not create and which do not serve women well in a larger sense. 
Women have a psychological and physical advantage to being better caretakers for children. This gender norm is enforced by a biological truth that I know you wish you could ignore. Now I refer you back to the Tender Years Doctrine, a piece of legislation authored by a feminist of her day specifically decrying men as nurturing caregivers of children and proclaiming women as the rightful holders of that particular title. You very much did create these standards, both socially and legally, and have been lobbying to keep them in place ever since. But your movement has lost so much perspective that you can't even keep tabs on the bullet points of your own collective agenda anymore. I suppose that's what happens when feminism abandons any semblance of an official leadership structure in exchange for more personal interpretations. Uh, yes, we are not as easily deemed predators when we attend a children's playground. This seems to come up a lot for men's rights activists. Um, I would also attribute that to social norms regarding how normal it is in society for a woman to spend time with her children over a man. I'm not saying it's right or better that women are assumed to be better at parenting or less predatory or that we should never pay for dinner. None of those things. In fact, it hinders equality for all genders to maintain these norms which push us into these neat little boxes uh, in which we don't all fit. Due to the sexual dimorphic nature of humanity, men and women are not equal. They were not created to be equal in any other way other than we are equal under the law. We have equal opportunity to live our lives the way we want to, but it doesn't mean we're all going to come to the table with the same advantages and the same talents. And backtracking just a bit, I love how you throw air quotes around the word predators, along with that confused look on your face as you ponder why this topic comes up with MRAs as often as it does. There are still companies and institutions out there pushing for the default demonization of strange men around children. This is why Virgin Airlines was sued for demanding a man trade seats with a woman regarding sexist assumptions about his supposed gendered intent. It's also why so few men work as primary education teachers compared to women because of the stigma that follows their gender into that field. And it's why women never showed up on To Catch a Predator, to my knowledge, and why Deborah Lefebvre's victim was told that he should consider himself lucky because she was so hot. Feminist lobbying interests are perfectly poised to solve these problems if they so wish, but they can't be bothered to address issues that do not directly affect women. And yet, your kind insists on telling us that your movement is about equality, even when you let these blatant double standards slide. What I am saying, though, is that these privileges all exist in a domestic or private sphere. So while men are more easily accepted as the head of a company or of a family or a country, women are indeed more easily accepted as nurturing, submissive, and inferior. It's not that women are seen as being incapable of running a business. There are many very, very rich CEOs who are female, very successful business owners who are female. But the fact is, far fewer females aspire to and work towards the goal of being a CEO of a large company. It is not a sign of inequality when the majority of women have other interests, like raising a family, that take precedence over becoming a CEO or an owner of a company. While you are crying inequality over a difference in choices that people make, you are ignoring a very real inequality. An inequality that does not apply law and punishment equally among all people, and that is incarcerating far more husbands, brothers, and sons at an unjust and unequal rate for the same crimes. If you are a criminal defendant, it is better to be a woman than a man. For the same crime and with a similar criminal history, men are imprisoned much more frequently and for much longer sentences. Professor Sonia Starr at the University of Michigan Law School, she examined a huge database of federal criminal cases. She found that women are significantly more likely than men to avoid charges, to avoid convictions, completely. And they are twice as likely to avoid incarceration if convicted. Now, on average, men receive about 63% longer sentences than women arrested for the same crime. Now, Professor Starr estimates that the gender gap in sentencing is about six times as large as the, as the sentencing gap between black and white defendants. The over-incarceration of males may be one of the most serious gender inequities of our time. Are you noticing a pattern here, Skittles? The gendered roles into which men and women have fit over the generations have been the direct result of pandering to women's desires and in men ultimately picking up the slack on the other side of the fence because they couldn't expect anyone else to provide for them. Men are more often CEOs because they also more often work overtime, negotiate raises, and pursue promotions for the sake of advancing their careers at the expense of their free time. 
Women are more often allocated to caregiver roles not only because that is more often their natural inclination, but also because that natural inclination is extrapolated out into their academic and professional choices. You don't see many women in STEM fields because most women pursue sociology degrees that land them lower paying jobs with higher rates of personal fulfillment. And they do this because they know full well that at any time, their choice to abandon the workplace for the role of homemaker will be honored and funded by whatever male partner they have in their lives. The second point is chivalry can die. Really, men, if you're going to resent women because you pay for our dinner or open our doors, then just stop doing it. We're not forcing you to buy us drinks. And while you might think that being treated like a lady is a privilege, it really doesn't affect us nearly as much as you think it does. Um, your privileges as a man are widespread and they're mostly invisible to you. What you might call my privilege, like getting a free meal, uh, often comes with harmful strings attached, like the expectation that I'll sleep with you. And when it doesn't, it's simply a free meal. No institutionalized power included. Three, one interesting notion of female privilege is regarding how we're taught to express emotions. Women, it's true, are not chastised in the same way that men are when we show signs of weakness or emotions. But this is a result of patriarchal norms regarding what makes someone a real man. Uh, these are not norms that women created, and in, in fact, they use women and femaleness as the ultimate negation of manhood. So, man up, don't be a pussy, those kind of things, are ways of telling men to move farther away from the concept of womanhood. So to remove anything weak about them, because women equal weak and emotional, and men are not allowed to be either of those things and still remain men under patriarchy. It is not an imaginary patriarchy that is forcing men to be more masculine. It is based on the fact that through the development of our species, those masculine attributes were advantageous. They're an advantage for the warrior and protectors of our species. They are a benefit to the hunter and provider of our species. And they are attributes that have attracted the females of our species. Because of the survival of the fittest, the aggressive, the independent, these masculine roles have been propagated and reinforced in our culture. They are not bad. They exist because they are good for our species. First of all, you seem to have the massive misconception that you are speaking on behalf of all women concerning your perception of chivalry, when you are really only speaking for yourself and the other salty feminists out there. Mark my words, a cursory glance over many women's profiles on dating sites will tell you that many of them still very much expect to be taken care of and provided for. And as a man who has tried to go Dutch on dates before, I can tell you that it usually doesn't go over well. Second, there is no expectation for you to sleep with us. Admittedly, there is a hope that you will, yes, but we know that a free meal alone is not enough to guarantee it, and so do you. Because if it was, we wouldn't also go through the motions of taking you to the most expensive restaurants, dressing in a way that's appealing to you, driving a car that you like, or providing whatever other measures of atmosphere and pleasantries you have become accustomed to as women in the Western world. And unlike sex, these things are very much expected of men, and failure to meet these standards can at any time be considered a deal breaker. Yet if you refuse to sleep with us for any reason, and we react badly to it, it will be we who are considered out of line, not you. And regardless of how bad we take it, rape laws are still there to protect your decision despite the nuances of whatever social contract you just broke. Women are well aware of this, and as a result, there is no shortage of women in the world who will agree to go out with a man simply to get a free meal. And third, no. A woman's encouragement to show her emotions and a man's discouragement of the same behavior are in no way the result of any nefarious patriarchy. They are the result of instinct. A man actually has a visceral need to protect and care for a woman, a need that he cannot satisfy if he is too weak to do so. And historically speaking, the willingness to challenge violent confrontation has long been a necessity if we expect it to be effective in it. It is only very recently that we have mastered our environment such that violence will most often not be necessary to protect and provide. And there is actually data supporting these facts, unlike the patriarchy you feminists constantly point to yet cannot quantify. Women are allowed to be strong and are encouraged to be so, but men must be strong and can expect to die if they are not. And one more thing. Your callous dismissal of a free meal as just a free meal just goes to show how spoiled and privileged you really are. Food is the essence of what keeps our biology ticking, and there are a lot of people in this world who aren't even sure what their next meal will be, where it will come from, how clean it will be, or what they'll have to do to get it. Yet you scoff at a free meal as if it's as paltry as finding a lucky penny on a stroll through a park. 
So this is a harmful notion that both reinforces women as a lesser gender and asks men to carry an unfair burden in order to maintain their manhood. No one wins in this scenario. And finally, female privilege is having no pressure to be the sole or primary breadwinner in the family. I'm told this one a lot too. The perception that women can just rely on their husband for monetary support is harmful to both men and women. For men, it reinforces the social norm that men have to be the breadwinner in the family. Um, this is obviously a lot of responsibility and not living up to it can lead to other social stigma, which is unfair and unhelpful. For women, it actually can mean structural, structural bias against us. So women are perceived as the homemaker and are therefore looked over for jobs and promotions because of this notion that we can just rely on our husband's salary. No one wins in this scenario? Wrong. Women win in this scenario because there are countless safety nets to make sure that women are protected and provided for, and your aspirations are ventures of personal fulfillment, not necessities to survival. To see examples of this, you need look no further than the staggeringly higher male homelessness, murder, and suicide rates. And not only can women rely on men for financial support, they can also legally dismantle and absorb the life of a man who refuses to comply with this responsibility by divorcing him and taking him to the cleaners in alimony. Most alimony cases are filed and won by women against men. And if you look into the history of these laws as far back as the mid-19th century, it was even worse for men, because all a woman would need to do is accuse a man of failing to deliver on a promise to marry her, along with two witness testimonies that could easily be fabricated in order to financially consume him without any marital commitment beforehand. I also don't think you understand why it is a social norm that men be the primary breadwinner in a relationship. It is not arbitrary. The majority of women want to have kids at some point during their life. However, it's very financially difficult to be a single parent whether you are a man or a woman. So for most women, if they want to be financially stable and have a good environment for the kids, they have to depend on a man. The marriage is supposed to be a mutually beneficial agreement. It provides the best financial stability while still having kids. Men being required to be the breadwinner of their family is not a social construct, it is a practical requirement. For the vast majority of women who spend more time off and work fewer hours so they can take care of their children. And since time off is actually a practical requirement of giving birth, which is something only women do, it makes sense that men will focus on their careers so they can support the wife while they are doing this. Your mythical all-powerful patriarchy would have devised a plan to make men work harder, longer hours to support women if it secretly despised and devalued women. It's quite the opposite. It's far more logical to say that women are far more valued and shown preferential treatment in our culture. And this perceived privilege actually hurts women who are career driven because studies show that companies are less likely to hire a female candidate due to the perceived risk of them getting pregnant and needing to go home and nurture the child. So even if we don't want kids, our status as women means that we are assumed to be that nurturing stereotype, which might just decide to stay home and stop working. And that works against us as women. So female privilege is ultimately a surface privilege. It might give women some small benefits like free food or the ability to cry in public without it threatening our womanhood, but it doesn't hold any real structural or substantial power. We are placed on a pedestal due to stereotypes surrounding us as the fairer, gentler sex. And though we might seem privileged above men in some respects, this pedestal does not lend itself to the many varied lives that women want and deserve to live. Some of us want children and to stay home. Others want high stakes careers um, and no kids. This pedestal you've got us on leaves us very little room to express our sexuality freely or want really anything outside of the norms we've been told our whole lives. You drone on about what women want, yet never once do you give even the slightest consideration to what men want. Do you think if it weren't for the responsibility to women forced onto them by society, men would want to spend so many of their waking hours toiling away at soul-sucking office jobs? Do you think men would wear suits, or even bother to maintain your higher standards of cleanly and presentable living spaces? Well, if the MGTOW of the West and the herbivore men of Japan are of any indication, the answer is no. In completely abandoning their pursuit of women altogether, most men default to simple lives and simple pleasures, because they are rejecting any notions of judgment on their dateability. Part-time jobs, small living spaces, used cars or no car at all, and lots of video games. 
and the media response to this has been to chastise men and urge them to return to the workforce and to try to remind them of the satisfaction they receive in taking responsibility for someone other than themselves. And yet, in all of this entitled blathering, you still deny that there are any structural or institutional advantages this dynamic affords you, even though it is trivial to list them. Women's shelters drastically outnumber men's shelters, even though men are more often the victims of violence. There are no transportation services exclusive to men, but there are for women, even though men are more often assaulted and murdered. The Duluth model, put there by your own movement's lobbying once again, grants women the assumption of innocence in any case of domestic violence and defaults to the arrest of the man even if he is the only one with visible wounds. And when was the last time you heard about a man cutting off his wife's breasts or clitoris spoken about in jest on daytime television? There was once a time that feminism was a movement about equality, but those days are long gone. It is now a cultural Marxist movement full of perpetual victims that labels annoyances as oppressions and uses it as justification to demonize and punish men. So privilege is about the way that society accommodates you. Society does not accommodate women when we step off of our feminine pedestal. And that is not privilege, it's sexism. Women step off of their feminine pedestals all the time when they apply for military, police, or firefighting roles, and society accommodates them with lower standards of qualification so they can enjoy the prestige of the job without having to be as effective in saving lives. They step off of their pedestals when they proclaim that they need men like fish need a bicycle, and society accommodates them with stages and book deals from which to shout their empowering message. They step off of their pedestals when they demand entrance into spaces exclusive to males, or even perceived as male-dominated, and society accommodates accommodates them with affirmative action quotas and anti-discrimination standards to which spaces dominated by women are not equally upheld. Your complete lack of introspection is appalling and typical. No one is preventing you from doing anything you want to do with your life or expressing yourself or your sexuality in any way you want to. Women with sufficient drive and talent can do anything a man has done. Yes, some things are easier for men, just like some things are easier for women. This is because men and women are not equal in all areas. Because of this, you cannot force men and women to have equality of results. When you compare stats like how many men and women are in the STEM fields and what is the average income of men and women, you're comparing apples to oranges because they have different situations that they're in. Like, just because less women are applying for the STEM fields does not imply an implicit bias. Just because women on average Average work less hours than men because they also take care of a family doesn't mean that wages are unfair. It doesn't make sense to go to college for a communications degree or a women's study degree and then complain that you're not a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. However, when you compare jail sentences for men and women with similar rap sheets for the same crime, you're comparing apples to apples. You complain so much about how not enough women are the CEOs of large companies when you yourself are not qualified. But when it comes to the inequality of how many men have died for your freedom to be such a dumbass, you don't want that equality. You only want equality in men when it benefits you. Thank you very much Hands for helping out with the video. Cubs, if you haven't already checked out his channel, please check it out. The link is in the description. And please remember, feminism is cancer. Direwolf out. I see the fighting Something's rising As I'm slowly, slowly dying I see